Hello and welcome to our new Ideas Powered for Business talk today on the art of making money with your intellectual property, the so-called IP valuation. According to a 2022 major EU-wide survey, only one out of 10 small businesses in the EU own registered intellectual property rights. Nevertheless, of those that have registered their IP, an impressive 93% saw a positive impact on their business. So it is clear that companies often overlook the gold mine that lies within their intellectual property assets. This talk today aims to shed light on the immense potential of IP valuation for you and how this has a direct and positive impact on your business revenue. Together with our six experts, we will emphasize on the critical role IP plays in your success and how the EU IPO and our partners support you in unlocking that potential. So let's get started. Pedro, let us get a common understanding of IP valuation. How would you simply explain it? Well, in simple terms, uh, IP valuation is a process to determine the monetary value of, of, IP, uh, of IP assets. Uh, the growing importance of IP valuation is mainly due to the significant changes in the way companies are able to generate and, and deliver value. Um, today, more than 90% of, of companies' value is coming from intangible assets as a, a direct result of their innovation processes and creations of, of the mind. So it's now obvious that a value, for example, for Apple or, or Amazon, is based on their IP and their capacity to innovate, and it's not on the value of their physical infrastructure or, um, or tangible assets. Um, but because we are dealing with, with assets, in many cases not registered and not even identified as an IP asset, it's important at all times uh, to know their contribution to generate potential value benefits that can come from its direct exploitation, sale, or, or licensing. However, in order to be able to enter into any commercial agreement based on IP, it will be needed to identify the asset and its potential value. That's where IP valuation plays a role in blocking the potential value of IP, in particular for SMEs and startups. Ignacio, Pedro has just mentioned the hidden value of IP for most businesses in Europe. If you were a startup, what would be the most effective strategy for monetizing your intellectual property in today's competitive market? Well, thank you very much for shedding light on the role of um, IP in the European business scene. Um, for me, to strategically monetize the, uh, the IP, st startups require to, um, a well-defined methodology. And here's how, 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 I, how I will get started. First, what you must do is you have to identify your IP asset. Well, it seems very basic, but it's the first step, such as unique software, novel manufacturing processes, or a distinctive brand identity. Understanding and cataloging your IP is the, the foundation of your strategy. Thus, you have to, to make a comprehensive inventory of all your IP assets, such as patents, trademarks, copyrights, tra trade secrets, domain names, and always verify their, their legal ownership. Second, what you have to do is you, you have to protect your IP because in Europe's competitive environment, IP isn't just about defense. Securing your legal rights transform your IP into a significant asset for attracting customers, investors, and business partners. And third, you have to assess the market viability of your IP. Does it shine more in a niche market? Does it have a more widespread appeal? Conducting a market research and possibly a financial valuation of your key assets is crucial for guiding your monetization approach. Fourth, uh, I would develop always a monetization plan. This might involve, as Pedro said, licensing, direct exploitation, selling your IP, using it as a loan collateral, but always focus on innovative ways to reach those potential investors, licensees, customers, partners. Um, and fifth, you have to monitor and enforce your IP rights. Stay proactive in guarding against infringement and have a robust strategy to protect your IP from unauthorized use. And six, very important, um, remain adaptable. The market is always evolving and so should your 
IP strategy. Um, regularly check how your IP is performing financially and adjust your approach based on market feedback and how and the changing competitive landscape. This methodology, all these steps, ensure that your IP assets um, are not only legally protected, but also perfectly aligned with the market, thus enhancing their differentiation and financial potential. Um, listening to you, Ignacio, I very much appreciate your point on the need for startups to define a strategy and a methodology. Veronique, what are the most common methods for monetizing IP? Ignacio has mentioned already licensing, selling or using IP as collateral for financing. Thank you, Sabina, for this question and for letting me enter this conversation. By monetizing IP, one means to make money from IP or to valorize this IP. Hence, IP monetization refers to the act of using intellectual property to generate revenues. There are multiple ways to generate revenues with IP across industries, from media to healthcare. Um, those ways to derive IP I'm going to list them now, but there's no priority uh, in this list that I'm offering now. So the first one is, uh, is the sale of the product or the services that use the IP. For example, you make a product, you produce a medicine and or you design uh, a patent or utility patent that offers a service uh, uh, util utilize, utilizing <laughs> this IP. Royalty payment generated by a license agreement is a second option for monetizing your IP because putting IP in operation requires new knowledge and know-how. Then licensing the IP to experienced entities that can produce, again, for example, medicine can be a smart option. Proceeds from IP sales is a third option. This means that you sell the whole bundles of rights that are associated to the property, to the uh, intellectual property. The sale allows the buyer to apply monetizing strategy, but it excludes at the same time the former IP holder to do so. So it's really a transfer of property rights. Um, the fourth option uh, is uh, revenues through damages. This one is harder to plan, but this can exist whenever you're enforcing the IP against infringers, like uh, Ignacio just mentioned it. This IP provides not only the right, the IP that you're holding provides not only the right, but also uh, not, not only the right to produce something from this IP, but also exclusion right. It means that you can exclude people from using uh, your IP. The fifth uh, option is basic res uh, uh, resource uh, generation by using IP as a collateral. IP can be used for, for you to be like a guarantee and then you bringing new fundings, new resources into your, comp your company. So strategies of collateralization or securitization, as we name them, are probably the most recent monetization strategy. They were first developed by pioneers, uh, but this is an option that is extending now. And in my understanding, we're working on developing this strategy. Banks and creditors that accept IP as a security interest um, are accepting it in exchange for a loan. So this can be a way not to generate revenues, but to generate resources for your company. Thank you, Veronique. Gaia, how do Veronique's methodologies match actually the reality of the businesses that you are dealing with? What do you think of it from a practical point of view? Thank you, Sabina. So at Interbrand, we attribute value to one intangible asset, which is the brand. And we approach it in the following manner, asking what capability does this intangible asset have to generate future streams of revenues and profits and thus economic value. And this approach makes sense only if we understand the brand as the sole inimitable asset a business possesses, particularly now that entry barriers have collapsed <clears throat> largely due to the digital and technological revolution. So in an environment where competitive advantages or capabilities are so easily replicable, it's a brand that clearly stands out as the unique and proprietary asset that a business can deploy to create distinctive value in the minds of consumers. So to address your question, 
it is interesting to go back into the history of the first ever brand valuation being conducted. It was back in 1988 when a company called Rank Service McDougall, RHM, appointed us to conduct the first ever brand valuation for balance sheet financial services purposes. At the point they approached us, RHM had accumulated a mixed portfolio of long established UK food brands. And there was another company called GFW that was poised to conduct a hostile takeover bid. So by giving a concrete value to all the brands within the portfolio of, of RHM, so investors in the market upgraded the value of RHM, which made the deal serve for GFW and prompted an immediate withdrawal of the hostile takeover bid. Eventually, the brands were taken over by another company called Tungsten, but this company paid a price that covered also for the brand value. So therefore, when considering those nine out of 10 small businesses in the EU that did not possess registered intellectual property rights, I believe this example clearly highlights the significance of the value of intellectual property for the business. Behoni, given the reality check provided by Gaia, would you like to give a short feedback? Gaia is pointing to a very interesting feature in valuation, the fact that the book value of an intangible entity is different from its market value. I'm saying entity because an asset is something that is recognized in a balance sheet. One reason for this is that intangibles are not necessarily intangible assets. For example, international accounting standards they do not recognize internally generated intangibles in the balance sheet. They only recognize intangibles in the case, um, intangible assets in the case of business combination when they qualify as inten identifiable intangible assets. This inv invisibility is an issue because it hides some value away from the eyes of the investors and can be misleading when investing in a company. The main rationale behind the standard setter decision is the idea that those assets are riskier than tangible assets, so that makes the whole difference. However, this statement is strongly debating, debated nowadays because tangibles are much more vulnerable, vulnerable than they used to be decades ago. Also, some companies that are pure intangible players have shown very good abilities to last, as we will discover uh, with Polly just after uh, my speech. Finally, this poses another problem, that of the misalignment uh, of the legal recognition of the asset that is provided by IP right and their absence in the representation of the financial statement uh, for the IP rights holder. What is obvious that we live in a rapidly evolving business world. This brings us to Polle, who is especially interested in companies in trending sectors such as e-commerce, ad tech or streaming services and the link to IP. Polle, how do these intangible assets translate into tangible benefits? Thank you, Sabina. Um, well, I always try uh, as a IP evaluator, um, try to to, to determine together with my clients is um, what revenues can be allocated to the IP. IP is in essence uh, intangible, but you can make it tangible by uh, when it's as soon as it starts uh, uh, generating revenue. So uh, if you can allocate revenues to IP, it becomes tangible from my point of view as a uh, IP evaluator. And um, this is particularly true with companies like tech companies or uh, pharmaceutical uh, startups that have a long way to market, have a long way to go before they actually reach the market. It's very hard then to uh, determine the value uh, for, this, for the IP involved uh, because there's a lot of risk um, between uh, the actual conception of the company and the moment that until it reaches the market and starts generating revenues. And also, um, it's, um, it, it requires a different kind of entrepreneur. So with the, um, and this is, this is important because these young, and, uh, these young companies, these early stage companies, they need to generate uh, uh, cash uh, in order to make the investments required to actually develop their product or their service. 
then valuation is a very important part of that process. Uh, because uh, an investor will want to know what is the actual value of the IP in which basically I invest, because it's uh, often the foundation of venture. Um, in doing so, we um, I never work for, with book value. We work on the basis of the economic value, that's the, the discounted cash flow method, and then in combination with a um, uh, real options analysis. And, um, then we, so, so that's the way we determine the value. But then there's another aspect, and that is the price. We can determine the value of an IP or, or an asset, an IP asset. But then it doesn't mean that uh, the investor uh, um, is willing to actually uh, pay accordingly. So there's always a distinction between the economic value and the price. The actual market value, as it were. And that makes it difficult. Thank you, Paula. Let's bring back Pedro now. We all understand now that the vital importance of the value of intellectual property. But Pedro, the $1 million question, in your experience, how can a startup generate more revenue through IP? If I was able to provide a, an easy answer, I would be rich by now. No? Um, one thing I'm, I'm sure that innovation is a key element and aligned with a solid IP strategy based on identification, protection and defense of all IP assets will be definitely contribute to, to increase value. Uh, products, processes, even trade secrets can be valuable uh, due to their capacity to, to generate potential future benefits. Um, as any other valuable item must be protected. So protecting IP is ensuring this capacity to generate return that goes beyond the simple direct exploitation of, of the asset. Uh, based on market evidence, for a big part of startups, the IP value is coming from this commercial uh, agreements such, a, such as sale, licensing operations, that are only possible if the assets are protected and the IP policy, uh, policy is, is established. No? Thank you. Ignacio and Gaia, from your point of view, how does IP monetization drive growth and revenue streams? Ignacio, please. Yes, um, IP monetization is really a game changer for startups um, because it, it turns unique ideas into brand and uh, brand identities into valuable financial assets. Um, it offers multiple benefits. First, it, diversi it diversifies revenue streams because it allows startups to uh, not only um, uh, have income by by selling their products and services, but also by but also by selling, licensing their IP or selling their IP or even um, having access to funds. So so actually, it, it diversifies the revenue streams. Second, um, it having IP fosters strategic alliances because managing your IP effectively can lead to partnerships that enable. Uh, new code developments or access to new, mar new markets. Um, also, and um, we have already highlighted this, um, uh, IP monetization enhances the financial position of a company. Um, IP assets boost the company's capital and they can also serve as collateral for loans and they can even attract investors. So they improve the financial stability of the company. Um, finally, like um, IP monetization provides competitive advantage. I mean, leveraging your IP helps startup, um, a startup establish a new market, unique market position and outpace its competitors. So in essence, monetizing your IP is vital because it, it, it yields not only immediate financial gains, but also it promotes sustained growth on the long term. Gaia, what's your opinion? Building up on um, what uh, Ignacio said, and drawing upon the analysis conducted by Interbrand over the past 25 years, I would add that we have concluded that IP monetization not only serves as a tool of business growth in terms of premium pricing, royalty rate setting, etc., but in recent years, re in particular, we have observed how certain businesses are leveraging the power of the brands to enter new categories. And this is because consumers exhibit such a strong affinity with these brands that they trust the business when it decides to expand beyond its traditional core domain and source of income. 
Now a very important question to Paul. What do you advise startups to do to fully understand their intangible assets and to capitalize them? Which role play accountants who are most of the times the only financial advisor startups have? Thanks, Sabina. In my experience, startups often have great ideas that they believe can be monetized, but many have limited business experience outside their areas of specialization. They may not have fully considered their business model, the resources they will need, and how to protect the resources that they have. And this, of course, includes intellectual property, as we've heard from, from all the other people who have spoken so far. It, for me, it's vitally important that they sit down with a professional advisor. The professional advisor can advise them on the legal structure, their legal obligations, financial requirements, and also to identify those key assets that drive the business model. And in respect of intellectual property, as we've already heard, this could include brands, software, know-how, customer information, for instance. Once these have been identified, then we can talk about protecting them. And this can range from quite simple internal controls and security, for example, to restrict access to customer lists or know-how, to then the more complicated areas or uh, such as registering trademark and designs. And I believe that an accountant should be able to help with most of the startup's requirements in these areas. And where more technical advice is required, they should be able to refer the business to an appropriate professional, such as the sort of IP specialist that we've already heard from so far. Now, I appreciate for startups, this advice can appear expensive, and especially when a business is in startup mode with restricted resources. But in many cases, it is far easier and therefore far cheaper to avoid making mistakes in the first place than trying to correct them once they have been made. Additionally, being able to demonstrate that you have adequate protection for your most essential assets, this will bring credibility to providers of funding if you're looking for seed funding or even for general funding, general financing. And, and after all, for many startups, the main assets they are likely to have at this phase will be intangible ones. Thank you, Paul. Can IP and its protection generate more revenue for startups? Well, I think so, yes, definitely. Um, apart from giving credibility to finances that you are a serious player, there are circumstances that access to finance uh, and generating revenue will, depend, will be dependent on having intellectual property and properly protecting it. For example, if the business model does or is likely to depend on licensing and franchising, which we've already heard discussed, failing to protect the underlying IP will critically undermine the business model, and it will open up the business to losing IP due to IP theft. And failing to consider IP protection where you intend to license the IP would be the kiss of death if you're meeting with financiers trying to obtain seed finance or, or general finance. And also, you have to consider it from the other side. Failing to properly check if, in, if similar intangibles have already been registered will open your business up to legal claims from the holders of such rights, which is likely to be extremely expensive, horribly time consuming, and ultimately damaging to the business's reputation. Gaia, do you know any impressive case or example of the value of intangible assets of a business? Sure, I can share some data on this matter. So for instance, we know that the brand plays an incredibly significant role as a driver of choice, reaching up to nearly 70%, especially in the case of luxury brands. Additionally, we are aware that brand value can constitute a substantial percentage of the total business value. Based on our most recent calculations, considering the top 100 most valuable brands globally, this percentage is estimated to be around 25%. So it's about one fourth of the total business value. That's an impressive number. Now I have a final question to all of you. What is the one tip that a European business should take away from today's talk to get the most out of their intellectual property? Let's start with Polly. Well, in my view, it's, it's quite simple. It's um, make a plan. Think before you do. Uh, there's no, there's not much more to it, and I fully agree with Paul. Uh, 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 ask for the help of a professional. 
don't think you know it all by yourself. Uh, just do it the right way, professional. Thanks, Paula. What about Veronique? What is your tip? Yeah, I will answer as a valuer too. So I have to mention the importance of the valuation process, not only because it's an operation of labeling an IP with a price tag, but it's rather a process of collective discovery of the worth of the investment and its potential evolution. It's a means to share Building a valuation together is a means to share in a common language the common vision that the team has about the becoming of the asset of the company. And they will translate it into a business plan that Polly just mentioned and a monitoring tool. And, and the valuation tool becomes a monetary tool that is very useful to understand in one manner, in what manner the objectives are met and why they are not, if they are not. Hence, it is also very useful for other operations like impairment tests, not only for price labeling. I pass the ball to Ignacio. Yes, um, well, I would say that um, intellectual property is not merely defensive. It's essential. It's an essential tool for business growth and revenue generation, and that that requires a change of your set in mind. Because normally you stun, understand IP as just defensive protection. No, it actually, of course, it in, 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 it involves investing in your not only the development but also in the protection of your intangible assets. But that's not enough. Basically, that's only the first step. If you want to make true monetization of your IP, that requires strategic management and a method of a methodical leveraging of those assets. So, Pedro, what is your tip? Well, difficult to select one, but the importance of, of IP protection aligned with the market strategy and a systematic assessment of value can be, of course, a good way for European companies to innovate and succeed. Paul, what do you say? Well, Paula has uh, stolen my thunder a bit, but I'll introduce the maxim. If you, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Protect your business as much as possible against foreseeable risks to help your business through the difficult uh, startup phase. And this most definitely includes protecting your intellectual property. And finally, Gaia. So I would say understand that your brand is the sole inimitable asset that your business possesses. Take it seriously, invest in it, register it, nurture it, and build the business around it. In this way, you'll be sure to seize the highest return. I would like to warmly thank our expert guests for their value insights today. See you all in our next Ideas Power for Business talk.